It's March the 16th, 2024. As you know, the advent of artificial intelligence is all the rage. So I decided to ask the AI software chat GPT to write tonight's introduction. Here, word for word, is what the software wrote. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself for a musical experience that's bigger, fatter, and funkier than a sumo wrestler on roller skates. Give it up for the Grammy-winning sensation Gordon Good was Big Fat Band. These guys are so good, they can make a stone statue do the cha-cha. With more brass than a noisy trumpet factory, more swing than a monkey on a trapeze, and more pizzazz than a sequin factory explosion, this band will blow your socks off and leave you begging for more cowbell. So, so... Prepare to have your jazz-loving souls blown away. Whether you're a die-hard jazz aficionado or a rhythmically challenged novice, their infectious energy and unparalleled talent will leave you awestruck, toe-tapping, and begging for an encore. Get ready for a musical extravaganza that will have you saying, damn, that's one big, fat, band.
Good evening to everybody. Hey, what's happening? I, I uh, hope that there's an opportunity in your lives to experience the uh, emotion that I felt this week. Tuesday, driving out here, walking into my high school band room to rehearse with that all district band. And I'm walking in the door and I look up and it was like forever ago and yesterday at the same time. And uh, it is just uh, for me to see the, the uh, heritage, the lineage of the program, the music program here at San Dimas and also Benita High School. And I like to think that Robin Snyder and some of my classmates back in the 70s had something to do with that. You know, we had that we, we started the rehearsal and the kids go, hey, when did you graduate from Benita? And I go, well, it was like 1973. And they just cracked up. <laughs> nice. And then I realized some of their parents might even be alive by that point, you know. <laughs> anyway, a great privilege, a great honor, you know, for us to be here, playing here uh, for you all. And thank you so much for your warm response. Uh, the first tune we played was our tribute to a, uh, a soul band you may be familiar with. They're up in Oakland. They're called Tower of Power. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of course, those guys are extremely funky. So funky, you can't really be as funky as them you might be able to get close, which is why that song's called T.O.P. Adjacent. And it features the amazing Danny Kanayuki on the alto saxophone. Uh, we're gonna move on and play some music that I wrote for my cat. And, uh, and I really, oh, that's really kind of a lie. It was my daughter's cat. I don't like cats. <laughs> Except for this cat was pretty cool as cats go, you know? She would like you, let you pet her and she would hang with you and stuff. Thing is, she liked to be out of the house. Open the front door, boom, there she go. And she liked to hang in the garage. Our garage, which at the time like, would have possums in it and snakes and coyotes. And, and this cat kicked all their asses. <laughs> I don't know how she did it, but she lived to be 23 and, and she deserves her own chart. So this is it. This is dedicated to Jasmine, our cat. And we're going to feature uh, Joey on the percussion. That's Joey back there. Yeah, you! <laughs> as well as Mike Stever on the trumpet. That's Mike back there. <laughs> Annabelle Seminario. That's Annabelle right here. That's my man. And Ray Brinker on the drums. The name of this song is called Garaje Gato.
Annabelle Seminario. Mike Steeper. Joey DeLeon. Ray Brinker. Thank you. You know, we put the band together in uh, kind of late 1999. First record came out in 2000, which means it's easy, the math is easy for me. And I know that next year is our 25th anniversary of this freaking band. I don't know how it happened, you know. Uh, it just feels like we're <laughs> figuring it out. Thank you. So. so in the course of that time, we have like a, a stack of music, you know, this thick, hundreds of charts that we've you know, accumulated over those years. And um, can't do them all. And we also feel like we need to play some of the old, old favorites, but also keep on growing artistically, keep adding to the repertoire. So in, in, in light of that, we're going to play a new chart for you right now. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different. We're going to feature Andy Waddell on, on the guitar. That's Andy back there. Yeah. But we're also going to bring out our chick singer. Now, some of the times we let her, we actually let her sing words, but in this case, she's just going to do scat dee dap dee dap dee doos for us on this song. Acts as kind of an orchestral orchestrational texture. And she's going to be singing along with the horn section. Let's please welcome the lovely and talented Banji Gunn to the stage. There she is. The name of this song is called Everywhere You Look. You having fun? Yes. Ba da 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 ba da
to hear our amazing sax section now. Come on, guys. That's Benji Gunn on the guitar, Andy Waddell. Some years ago, maybe 10 years ago, we did a gig, and it was a, a tribute to a particular American composer. And we did an arrangement that I did of that man's music that night, and it became obvious to us that we probably were going to never stop playing that chart. Less because of how we played it or how I arranged it, but we realized the power of this guy's music and how it um, somehow just connects viscerally with people. All over the world, we play this thing in, in Japan, in Asia, in, in Europe, everywhere. There's something about the humanity in this music that touches and moves people, and this thing's 100 years old. So... There is something in there that's hard to pin down. Uh, for us, it's just an honor to be a small part in the legacy of this incredible piece of music by America's greatest composer. We we'll hope you like our version of George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue.
on the tenor saxophone, Brian Clancy. On the trombone, Ryan Dragon. On the trumpet, Wayne Bergeron. On the clarinet, Anibal Seminario. Thanks, everybody. I, I, I kind of realize uh, sometime in my high school days that not everybody felt the same way about jazz that I did. Like a lot of my classmates were looking at me like, what's the matter with you, man? How come you count Basie? What is count what? You know, <laughs> so, you know, I kind of hung out with the people that thought like me a little bit at least, you know, and um, got out of the high school, get into college, get out of college, and I found out the world is not all that different, right? In terms of their understanding of what music of content is about. So it's a little elusive, so we, we, we tend to gather with those of us that are like-minded, us, you know, it's about a little less than 1% that like this kind of music, but it's a committed and powerful 1%, right? Nonetheless, that 1% doesn't enable you to pay your mortgage. Or your, or your electric bill. So you got to figure something out, right? So what, what a lot of us do in this town is we play, we play money that pays music. Uh, pays uh, money, rather. <laughs> There's a slip there for you. I mean, you, uh, if you live in L.A., if you're a good musician, you have some opportunities. Uh, I got a job at Disneyland right out of college, so that was a good thing, you know. Uh, a lot of us play in uh, recording sessions for movies and TV and things like that. So I was lucky to kind of get into that field. And in the 90s, I worked at Warner Brothers and we were working on animation shows. Uh, they were produced by Spielberg, which was pretty cool. And his, his edict was no synthesizers and no library music. Every single cartoon that we did was scored from beginning to the end. 40 piece orchestra. We probably had two or three sessions a week. It was a golden era for that kind of animation, 2D hand-drawn animation, and you know, live musicians playing on the score. No samples, no synths, you know, all that. So it was a cool thing, and during that time, I kinda got into this guy. Matter of fact, no kinda about it, I was compelled to do it by Warner Brothers, who said, this is where we want our music to sound. We want it to sound like this guy named Carl Stalling. Ever heard of him? Yeah, he invented, the principles of animation scoring, and he did it at the beginning, like he was around Disney during Steamboat Willie days, right? First cartoon was sound. He was the guy that figured out how to sync it up, and he invented what became the modern click track. He's basically, uh, you punch holes in the, in the film every, every few frames, and it makes a popping sound as it goes to the projector, and that acted like a metronome. So he figured out how to do that, and uh, he also figured out a lot of other stuff about animation. Like if a character's walking across the stage, it would seem to float unless you had the strings going do 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 right? And so you learn these rules of the trade. Carl Stalling invented a lot of that stuff. A lot of guys uh, use his techniques to this day. And I was so into the guy that I wrote a piece kind of uh, trying to combine his style with big band kind of Bugs Bunny meets the big band, and the piece kind of took on a life of its own for us. We're going to play it for you now. The name of the song is called Hunting Wabbits. Thank you. 
Jay Mason of the Baritone Sax. Andy Martin on the trombone. Kevin Axt on the bass. I, I remember the moment it happened. Like 50 years ago. Uh, I remember so much about that moment. I'm standing in my band room at Ramona Middle School. All right. And my band director comes over to me and says, hey, kid, you know, um, Herb Alpert's great. I mean, don't get me wrong, but there's some guys I need you to listen to. So he says, K come here. And he takes me over to this cabinet we had in the band room. In the cabinet was a record player. And he pulls out an album, and it's got a, the album cover's got a picture of a guy, and he's uh, wearing a suit, and he's got like a sailor hat on, and he's got kind of a wry grin on his face. So he takes the vinyl out of the sleeve and flips it to side B, puts it on the, on the turntable, and then he takes the needle, you know, and he takes it and puts it on the last song of that side. And that was a song called The Queen Bee, composed by a guy named Sammy Nestico. And I stood there, and that music changed my life. I'm just, I don't know what it was I liked about it. Simple little tune, but something about it just hit me hard. And so Robin Snyder, my band director, he goes, you should write this kind of music, kid. And I go, well, I don't know how to do that. He goes, ah, you'll figure it out. I said, but don't you have to like transpose the saxophones or something like that? Isn't there? He goes, ah, you'll figure it out. Write the song, write it, bring it in. We'll play it in the stage band. Stage band is what they called jazz bands back then, because jazz was the devil's music. So it became a stage band on the stage. <laughs> so I'm thinking. He goes, just let me know when it's done. So I go home and I did figure it out. The thing is. Robin had a way of uh, being supportive and yet insistent, you know. It was hard to say no to him. So he fulfilled his promise. He played the chart. We recorded it on like a, a record we made that year. I was in seventh grade. And so, and he did that pretty much every year after that. Every chart I would write, no matter how shitty it was, he would play it. And then he would give me solos. And then he would say, hey, man, why don't, you, I can't, why don't you rehearse the band for a while? He let me conduct the band. He let me conduct the band at the Reno Jazz Festival, Monterey Jazz Festival. He'd step out of the way and, and let me conduct. He taught me what it was like to stand on the stage in front of an ensemble like this and kind of get them to do what you want. Now, I learned in later years there's another way to do that, which is to pay him money. That works pretty well. But Robin never had to resort to mercenary tactics like that. See, Robin Snyder, was, he was charismatic, you know? I mean, he, 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 he made you want to please him. You wanted to do your best. And that wasn't beyond him to get mad at us once in a while. But for the most part, music with Robin was fun. It was a blast. And the band room at Benita High School was like a, an oasis for us. It was band geek heaven, right? I don't know what else is going on in the rest of the campus, but in there, this was a safe haven. Same thing for most of Robin's domain. Like, we would go to his house, and we'd hang out and swim in his pool. We'd have jam sessions, you know, and we'd be there all the time. I mean, we, it was a student-teacher relationship that would get you fired today. <laughs> he would come and pick, he'd pick me up in the morning at 6.30, he'd pull into the driveway. A bunch of us would pile into his car. He would take us to school. We had 7 a.m. jazz band. Can't do that today either, right? If you didn't show up at 7, Robin would lock the door, and you're cooling your jets out there until 8. We were, we were into it. We bought into it, and we bought into Robin Snyder. We would rehearse, you know, 7, 7 to 8 a.m., come in at lunch. After we eat our lunch, rehearse for maybe half hour. After school, about 45 minutes, go home, do homework, eat some dinner, back to rehearsal for a couple hours. That was, the, that was the culture. And, you know, it was interesting because 
Robin, at that time, he taught me the commitment that was necessary to excel, not just at music, but at anything. You know, you got to go all in with it. And, you know, we did. There were other schools, other jazz bands that maybe had better players than us. But we worked so hard, we kicked all their asses. We won the trophies. Junior year, we won every festival we, that we entered. Right? So, and we'd run into these other kids at the festivals, and they would see our relationship with Robin Snyder, and they'd be envious. Man, I wish we had that at our school. We were lucky, and we knew it. We knew it at that time. It got, I never got to the point where I wa stopped wanting to impress him. You know, I mean, my first year at Cal State Northridge, he and some students stopped by to watch a rehearsal. I was in the A band as a freshman. Felt pretty good about it. And I had a piccolo part to play, and I'm trying really hard to nail it to impress Robin. And then we take a break, and I go to say hi to him. He goes, hey, kid, terrible piccolo. <laughs> and, you know, he was, he was right. He was completely right. Telling the truth, you know, was kind of not, he didn't mean it personally, he just was about that, you know. Do you know, I, I wrote a song and dedicated it to him. I was a freshman in high school, I wrote a song on the piano, because I was so inspired by him. I called it Snyder Rue, and I, I never told him about it. I never played it for him. I didn't play for anybody. I was, I was too embarrassed about it. I mean, who does that? I did that because I knew that I was so lucky to have this man in my life. You know, years later, years later, we invited him to my house for my mom's 80th birthday party. And uh, I just was so surprised that I so much wanted to impress him with my house and my studio and my family and everything, you know. And um, in the years before he passed, I called, him, well, I called him up. It was actually after his wife, Glennie, passed away. We're chatting about the old days, and then he says, you know, you know, Gordon, I should have treated her better. I, I should have been there more, and now I can't. And I said, Robin, you know, she knew what she was buying into. She knew what your mission was. She knew what, what you meant to those kids and what they meant to you. And she was proud of you, man. I don't know if I got through to him. Maybe not, but maybe a little bit. This is, this is the, the man that I was lucky to have in my life, and it wasn't just me. Even like people that were in the band but maybe weren't really that into it, they, he connected with those kids too. It didn't matter what your goals were. It didn't matter what your musical ability was. He saw you as an individual. And a lot of ex Bonita High School kids name him as their favorite teacher, even though they might have only spent a little time around Robin Snyder. Um, like all of us, Robin had his share of joy and pain in his life. He had to endure the passing of his wife, Glennie, and of his son, Bill. But he got through those hardships the way we all hope that we can, through a positive worldview, a persistent, optimistic spirit, and uh, all filtered through an in, uh, enduring love of music. This is a formula that I've kind of tried to use in my own life. And I can tell you this, I, I will never forget how fortunate I was to have a close relation, a close relationship with the amazing Robin Snyder. So we have something special planned right now. A little bit of a world premiere. Well, Actually, a world premiere after a 50-year uh, hiatus, because I went into the files, and I dug out that very first chart that Robin encouraged me to write. And I pulled it, I pulled it out of the files, and I'm laughing at it, and horrified at it at the same time, but thought, I think we got to play that chart here tonight. And, and uh, I took it and I put it into a more contemporary music, because I had written it out by hand back then, you know. Put it into this notation program. I didn't change a note. I didn't fix anything. So we're going to play that for you, warts and all. And, um, and, and I, I just want to, with the love and respect for a man that, that changed my life and many people's lives. The, uh, the name of this song is called <laughs> Hang Loose. 
please be kind. Here we go. Yeah, we might be putting that one away for another 50 years. <laughs> Somebody told me after that, you know what, kid, there's something called a bridge. You might want to look into that. <laughs> so uh, in, in 2004, uh, a lot of us in the Fat Band got involved in a film that uh, did pretty well. And um, I did some writing on it. And uh, a lot of us played on it. And then they made a sequel to it. About 14 years later, finally, they made a sequel, uh, sequel to this movie. And uh, it's around that time that I thought, you know, maybe I should finally write an arrangement of the theme song to that movie for this band. So I did. And um, we're going to feature Andy on the guitar. And we're going to feature the man in the back row, Rain, Wayne Bergeron, on the trumpet. And uh, I don't have to tell you the name of the song, because uh, you're going to know what it is after Wayne plays what he calls the five magic notes. Thank you. 
Oh, yeah. Andy Waddell. And Wayne Bergeron. I promised you earlier that the young lady that came and sang for you actually can sing words with syllables and meaning and everything. We'd like to bring her back out to do just that. Please welcome Banji Gunn.
Thank you. Thank you. So the next song I'm going to do for you is arguably uh, one of Gershwin's biggest pieces from his exquisite opera, Porgy and Bess. Um, Gordon and I needed to come up with a song for something, and we started messing around with the song Summertime. And so we came up with this arrangement together, and it's kind of fun. It's grown, and uh, we hope we give it honor. And so we hope you enjoy our version of Summertime.
That's Banshee Gun. Thank you, guys. And on the trumpet, Mike Rocha. It has truly been an unforgettable night for me to come back to the town I grew up in. I gotta tell you, I used to think that Laverne was kind of like Mayberry or something. <laughs> but I come back now, I go, this place would be a pretty good place to live, actually. So thank you so much for coming out and for your support of the music programs here in the Benita Unified School District. The importance of this is not that we need more musicians. They're always handy to have around, but the thing is what we need are people human beings that have an appreciation for the gray area in life. And that's what music teaches you. It teaches you to delay your gratification. It teaches you that, that excellence is accomplished step by step. It's, there's no automatic button to push to be good at something. And it teaches you that there are, there are um, shades in between light and dark and yes and no. And that's the kind of human being that I believe that we need today. Music does that for you. So thank you so much for your support of the, of the programs here in this area. Before we go, what if you could help me thank these incredible musicians in the Big Fat Band. <laughs> On the saxophone, Brian Clancy. Annabelle Seminario. Danny Kanayuki. Jeremy Lappet. Jay Mason, Ryan Dragon, Andy Martin, Ido Meshalam, on bass trombone, Craig Gosnell, on the trumpet, Mike Rocha, Wayne Bergeron, Tony Boncera, Mike Stever, on the guitar, Andy Waddell, on the bass, Kevin Axt. On the percussion, Joey DeLeon. And on the drums, Ray Brinker. Our very first record, which came out in January of 2000, was called Swinging for the, Fence, uh, for the Fences. Baseball term. We're going to play that song for you now and feature Ido Meshalam on the trombone, Mike Rocha on the trumpet, and Danny Kanayuki on the saxophone of his choice. Once again, thank you so much. It's been a privilege and an honor to be here tonight. Here is Swinging for the Fences.
Mike Rocha! Ido Meshalam! Danny Kaniyuki! Thank you, my name is Gordon Goodwin, and this is the Big Fat Band!
Well, we do know one more song. We're going to feature uh, Wads on the guitar, Andy Waddell. Joey DeLeo on the percussion and uh, Ray Brinker on the drums. This is a song that seems to caught on a little bit with the youngsters. It's called The Jazz Police. <laughs>
Eddie Waddell. <laughs> Joey DeLeon. <laughs> Ray Bricker. <laughs> Let's hear it for the big fat band, everybody. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon.